will be recorded um, and it is interactive. So please feel free to um, ask a question or respond to a question in the comments or unmute and participate in the discussion. Today we have uh, Jessica joining us. She's currently a contracts officer three in the Office of Research uh, at the University of Central Florida and is responsible for negotiating funded and unfunded agreements associated with sponsored projects. She is passionate about advancing science, scientific research and as evidenced by her work as a research administrator for the past six years and previously as an analytical chemist. Uh, Rebecca is currently the Assistant Director of the Contracts Office in the Office of Research at the University of Central Florida. She previously worked at Clemson University as an Associate Program Director in the Research Division, where she led the drafting, review, and negotiation of research-related agreements, and as Assistant General Counsel, where she functioned, functioned as the primary contact for legal issues related to research, including contracts, compliance, and intellectual property. and I are very excited to be here today talking with all of you. Um, was really excited to be back here for this virtual conference. This six years ago, this was my inauguration into research administration was coming to the FRAC conference. Um, so it's awesome that we're virtual this year, but with that means remote work life, you know, difficulties and my lawn crew conveniently just showed up. So I apologize if you hear them in the background. Uh, today, Becca and I are going to be discussing negotiation personalities, tips and tricks for successful negotiation. Again, we want this to be interactive, so please feel free to unmute yourselves, put questions in the chat. Next slide, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Becca Hannes, and as, as Jessica said, we're very much looking forward to this discussion with you. Um, we're hoping it's going to be a light and fun um, interactive conversation, um, but that you also will find it informative and be able to pick up some good tools to be able to use going forward in your negotiations. Um, so jumping right into the meat of things, negotiation personalities, um, and helping to come up with our idea and prepare for this um, discussion, Jessica and I were talking um, about how over the years we have encountered and worked with many different types of negotiators on the other side of the table, different types of personalities that they bring to the negotiation. Um, so we thought it would be a, a fun exercise to go through with you um, and share some of the different types of personalities that we have worked with. Um, over the years, and then also open it up to you um, to share your experiences and um, let us know, you know, the types of personalities that, that you have dealt with um, and maybe some, some fun stories along the way. Next slide, please. Okay, so our first negotiation personality is a big one. Um, this is a big personality. This is the bulldozer. This is a person who takes the approach, it's my way or the highway. And this may come through either through their written communications. Um, for example, if they um, are responding to your, your email and you've written them and said we have these you know, several different edits that we'd like to request and you've laid out very nicely all your reasons for why you want to ask for those edits and they just come back with an, a no. You know, we're not gonna consider that, we're not gonna do that. Or um, sometimes I, I've seen the answer where you know, please find our response attached. And they've just attached the original agreement that they sent you in the first place. It's like a non-response. Um, they're basically trying to bulldoze right over you know, your points, your perspective. They can also do this in person. You can experience this um, when you're having a conference call or a Zoom meeting as we all have these days. Um, and you're trying to talk and present your side and your um, positions and they just talk right over you. Uh, don't even wanna hear what you say. Even if they pause for a moment and let you speak, when they respond, they're jumping in right where they left off as if you hadn't even said anything at all. Um, I definitely feel like for those of us in research administration, we don't, we don't really so much have the luxury of adopting this personality, even if we, we wanted to. I think you know, for a lot of us, we're really trying to find ways to be collaborative, um, to be supportive of our faculty's research, to work together with them, um, and, and would definitely not have the backing of our leadership or our faculty 
um, to take this kind of approach. But you can definitely see this on the other side of the table. And sometimes, um, particularly with large um, corporations, you know, they may feel like they have a really strong negotiating position and, you know, they feel like they have the luxury of adopting, um, you know, this personality. Um, there could be some different challenges working uh, with someone that's a bulldozer, and we'll kind of talk more um, as we go through about some different strategies that you can use for all the personality types, including this one. Um, so something to consider, though, is um, whether or not that individual, I think, really is um, going to maybe be receptive to, you know, kind of breaking it down and kind of eventually working with you. Um, sometimes when, when it really comes to it, it's not our, anyone's first choice, but you have to consider, is this person really the decision maker? Um, or do you need to try to find a tactful way to get to that decision maker and get around this person that just does not want to um, work with you at all? And that may be either through suggesting a meeting, um, perhaps you, you, know, you nicely suggest, let's have a, a call and talk through you know, these three issues that I think are on the table. And you'll bring the decision makers from your side, we'll bring decision makers for all, from our side, and we'll all get together. Um, and you're basically just inviting the decision maker into the room kind of around that person, but also offering on your side so that it's a, a mutual um, activity. Um, you can also um, do it more subtly um, by you know, involving your, your faculty member. If you and your faculty member have a really good relationship, you're on the same page about the issues and the, and the positions that you want to take, sometimes you can, can talk with that person and they can bring in their technical contact. There's often a very good relationship there and they can kind of pull some strings in the background on their side to get to the decision makers or to put pressure um, on that negotiator on the other side to kind of come around and start um, compromising with you and working with you towards your positions. Next slide, please. The deadline pusher. How many of you have dealt with somebody who imposes just what seem like arbitrary deadlines during negotiation? Now, I know sometimes we have real true deadlines. You know, maybe you have an agreement that needs to be put in place before a proposal deadline. So maybe you need to get an NDA in place or a teaming agreement, allocation of rights. Um, we even get agreements from agency that have very strict deadlines. For example, if you have a DPAS rated agreement, for those who don't know, that stands for Defense Priorities and Allocation Systems. Uh, these are used to prioritize national defense related contracts for supporting military, energy, homeland security, emergency preparedness, and critical infrastructure requirements. If you have a DPAS rated agreement, you have a very very specific time frame that you need to get that agreement in place. So while there are agreements that have, you know, very specific deadlines, I often find that people with this deadline pusher um, personality trait, they tend to just impose arbitrary deadlines. I recently worked in agreement where a company told us we had 10 days to review a 93 page master agreement. And, and they were very insistent on this deadline. So we worked very hard to get it through all our, you know, necessary ancillary reviews to our technology transfer office, export, you know, everything, get it back to them. And then they sat on it for three weeks. So you're like, well, I, I thought there was a, you know, a very big deadline and really there wasn't. I, I find this personality type can be a little frustrating um, when it's tied to an agreement but that's kind of ironic because in my home life, my husband will tell you that, that I adopt this. I put arbitrary deadlines when we're doing outings. I'm like, we're leaving in 10 minutes. We don't have a reason to be leaving in 10 minutes. So I don't know if any of you can relate to that. Uh, but when it comes to negotiating, negotiating agreements, you know, you might have a reason that a PI really does need an agreement put in place. Maybe they need to pay for, you know, a student, get them on a contract. So you might need to adopt a little bit of a deadline pusher personality. But I find that it's very helpful to be super transparent about why you have the urgency and provide as much information upfront as possible to speed up the negotiation in that event. Next slide, please. Okay, our next personality um, is the charmer. This is the person that um, wants to build a relationship. Um, really, really kind of almost um, antithetical to the bulldozer that we talked about before that just wants to have this like head to head combat in their negotiation style. This person wants to, to reach out, to be collaborative, to work together, to come to 
um, an agreement. I have a, a coworker um, currently who, when I first started working with, with her a few years ago, I noticed very quickly um, that she always seemed to be able to get her negotiations done really quickly um, and get so much of what we were, were wanting and sometimes more than I even thought possible. Um, she, would, she would bring me an agreement and it would just be marked up with all sorts of edits and changes that we would need and say, you know, this is really, this is really terrible. Um, I don't know how I'm gonna get all this, you know, what do you think? And I was like, yeah, this, this agreement's really awful. And here's some more things that I think we should ask for too. Um, and next thing I know, she would take it back and she would come to me and say, hey, I, I had a phone call and we talked it through and they agreed to everything we asked for in here, can you sign this? And it was like, this happened several times and I started to wonder, what is she doing? What is this magic? that is happening in her negotiations that she is able to accomplish this. Like I, I need to watch and I need to learn. Um, so I started paying a lot closer attention to kind of what she was doing, you know, watching when she would copy me on her emails with the sponsors, watching her when we were having our um, conference calls that I would join in and, and kind of seeing, you know, what, what is she doing? What techniques um, is it? And it was really this, this kind of charmer relationship building um, approach. Um, and right from the very, very beginning, the first initial conversations, um, she's always immediately very promptly is responsive. Um, not only is she sending a quick response, it's always very, very polite and appropriate. She starts her emails not with jumping into the contracts, but having some, some pleasantries explain, it expressed. And, you know, a little back and forth and, you know, I hope you're doing well, um, really kind of acknowledging the other person, you know, as a person, acknowledge, acknowledging that um, and, and treating them with, with kindness and respect. And it really builds um, this really great basis for being able to then have a negotiation um, because you are showing that person from the beginning um, that you really respect and you value them um, as a person and you see them as a person first. And that carries through not only from you know, her email communications, but then also you know, if there's a need when we would have to have a few points maybe remaining and we're all getting together on a conference call, it, sometimes those can be very awkward and you feel like it's kind of two sides against each other. Um, when I join in on her conference calls, it's like everybody in the room is like her friend. Um, she's already built that rapport with everyone. So it's, it's very light, it's very conversational. You know, if, if we had had to delay the meeting, perhaps because somebody was on vacation, um, you better believe that the first thing out of her mouth is going to be, oh, you know, hi, Susan, you know, how was your, your trip to Hawaii with your family? Did you have a good time? I've always wanted to go. You know, that sounds really lovely. Um, always exchanging those kinds of pleasantries to um, just, just make them know that you, you respect them as an individual. Um, and you can really get pretty far in a negotiation um, starting from that premise. Next slide, please. We have a, actually a couple comments in the chat um, agreeing, you know, sharing the why is very helpful for buy-in. Uh, kill them with kindness is a great way to deal with bullies. Um, one uh, comment here says that they've encountered this personality where on the phone they would be this way, but uh, would not budge uh, once you started to negotiate in writing. Um, and I agree, you know, there's opportunities where you have a conversation with someone, you conceptually agree to something, and then all of a sudden, via email, it's uh, um, back to the, uh, the approach of bulldozing. Yeah, definitely. And I think it can, it can go both ways. And sometimes when you're dealing with that bulldozer, it's good to keep in mind, you know, if somebody's being really obstinate over email, you know, try having a phone conversation and see you know, that they may be much nicer um, in person on the phone, or vice versa, if they're being being obstinate um, in calls. I've also had it work in the reverse where they're much easier to deal with for whatever reason um, by email exchange and maybe just, just a medium that they're more comfortable with. Um, so don't be afraid to, to get a little creative. If you see one approach is not working, try something else. Next slide, please. Oh, perfect. So the comic. Um, just like the charmer, they have that charming aspect. They kind of charm you and disarm you. I, I tend to really notice this personality type when we're on conference calls or Zoom calls. This is the person who's usually making you laugh at the beginning of the call. They are like the master of icebreakers. So uh, 
I, I really enjoy this person in a negotiation because they might throw out these silly far-fetched scenarios just to kind of remind us of you know what is the likelihood of that risk actually occurring. I even encountered several times where the PI kind of tends to take on this role during a call. So we'll have the contractual team and the technical team on the call and the PI is usually the one who's like, yeah, but come on, you guys, this isn't going to happen. I'm going to be doing this and 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 really reminds us, you know, of what the intent is of the party and not to all, all take everything too seriously. But sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating working with this personality type because risks are are risks and some of them are serious and should be taken seriously. So for for this personality type, I find it helpful to use very common down to earth examples of risks and past experiences. Next slide, please. Okay, this next personality is the salesperson. Um, this is the person who takes the approach. Let me tell you how this is going to benefit you. Um, I will admit freely that this is definitely my negotiation personality the vast majority of the time. Um, when you're coming at a negotiation, um, you're obviously looking um, in your contract for the items that are problematic for your institution and your PI, that's a given. Um, but the other side doesn't necessarily care about the reasons for why you want your specific edits. They wanna know what's gonna be best for them. How is it going to help them? Um, and so I always try to utilize this both in, in my written communications and um, in my verbal communications. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, when dealing with our non-disclosure agreements. Um, as a public state university, um, our institution um, always tries as our preferred position to ask for marking of confidential information. Um, and one of the, the reasons for this, there are several, um, is that it just makes it easier for our, our faculty. It's, it's much easier for them to know that they've received something that is considered confidential information and then to treat it appropriately if it comes to them and it's marked. So, you know, that's a big help to us, to our institution, to our faculty. That's one of the main reasons that we always wanna to try to ask for that. Um, however, the other side doesn't necessarily care. Um, so that the comment that, that me and a lot of my coworkers will, will put back when we ask for marking is well explained, you know, as uh, you know, public university, we're subject to very broad um, public records laws in Florida. Um, and so we, we ask that information that's provided to us that's confidential is marked as such. And that will help us to ensure that if there's a public records request, that your information is not inadvertently disclosed and it will help us to protect your valuable information. So in other words, we're turning the argument around to explain how this is going to benefit the other side, what is in it for them. Um, and that, that argument is usually effective most of the time. Next slide, please. We have a, a couple of comments and a question in the chat. Um, sure. Again, agreeing with you that, you know, kindness and approaching them um, compassionately is a great way to go. Um, and then picking up uh, the phone and giving them a call or scheduling a Teams or Zoom call is a, a preferred mode of communication when negotiating. Um, and then we have a, a question. Any advice with dealing with a faculty who thinks they are helping but really are making it harder? That is always an interesting challenge because um, you obviously don't, don't want to make them feel, feel badly that their help is not wanted. Um, but I think you know, having, having a personal one-on-one -on -one internal call with them talking through the positions, making sure that they are comfortable, that you really understand what their positions are and have their best interest at heart, um, then I think that they're more likely to let go and let you be involved. Um, in the conversation. In my, in my previous institution, when I first started working in contracts, um, there hadn't been a lot of trust in the office, um, between the office and the faculty. So they always wanted to be extremely involved in their contract negotiations, which was um, sometimes a little, a little difficult to navigate. Um, but as we were able to work through and kind of explain you know, what the positions were and let them feel that we were really there to help them, um, they were more than happy to back off and go and do their research and their, live the rest of their life and do their other things um, and let us take care of the negotiation um, for them. Um, so I think kind of establishing that, that relationship building and trust you know, internally with your faculty member can really um, help in that way.
So now we're curious, um, have you encountered any of these negotiation personalities before? You know, feel free to unmute and jump in or put questions or comments in the chat. Is there one that you identify with the most? Are you maybe one on paper, but different on a call or in person? Are there others you can think of that we've missed? No, I've actually definitely encountered the bulldozer before. I once, very early in my career here at UCF, uh, had a formal memo sent to me about the ridiculousness of my edits. So that was a, a fun experience. Um, and with that one, it ended up, um, some of the comments are definitely true. Just getting on the call, having the conversation, this person was definitely very different over the phone. So I found that that helped. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Amber. This is a follow-up to that and it's your comment, which is a great point, that the salesperson seems like a good counter to the bulldozer. Did you feel like in the end that you use some of those, those sales techniques to try to, to counter their approach? I actually, I find myself to be more of the charmer, so I felt like that worked, that worked really well. Um, I agree with the earlier comment from another participant that the charmer is really kind of the best. I find like it just works with all of the different personalities. That's just been my experience. I totally agree. I think the charmer can be an extremely effective personality um, approach. I also think that, you know, when you're kind of looking at these, you know, we all may have bits and pieces of these. It's not like one size fits all. Um, and you also have to do what works for you. Like for me, I know myself that I am kind of introverted. I always feel like I'm kind of awkward in a group setting or a conversation. I, I'm never going to be that, you know, classic charmer. Um, but I feel like, you know, looking at the approaches of the charmer, the comic, the salesperson, they're all really kind of these sister personalities where they have the similarity throughout all of them, but they're trying to build that, that positive relationship, that spirit of collaboration. And so you can kind of try to, you know, see what my coworkers do that are excellent charmers and kind of, you know, steal some tips from them um, without, you know, having that being my full grown contract negotiation personality. Um, so I don't know, and that's another question, you know, for some of you as well, um, you know, kind of going back to, you know, which one do you think that you're most like, or are you some combination of different personalities? I think you could answer this question uh, as you answer a lot of questions in research administration. It depends. Um, it depends on the situation. It depends on the other party. I found myself acting in any one of these roles, depending on, you know, sort of who I'm working with. Um, and how quickly I need to get something done or how high risk an issue is. Um, looks like um, we have a couple more comments here. Um, uh, deflector could be one, uh, someone who avoids the actual point you're trying to make, uh, turning it around on you. I think that's a great, great one. Uh, and uh, learning other styles so you can pivot in the negotiation from your colleagues also seen where sometimes we have to get our legal counsel on the phone as well and so it, we almost pair off with conflicting styles you know almost a little good cop bad cop you know they they give the hard more bulldozing approach and then we'll chime in with a more charming approach and eventually it all works out yeah, absolutely. And ideally, you're able to either coordinate that in advance or just, you know, gain that familiarity and in working internally with your other colleagues so that you kind of, you know, develop that natural, um, you know, back and forth that works for you. Definitely. I have an example that doesn't really happen very often, um, which I can add to the categories, the, the scatterbrained one, because I did deal with a company that sent me twice the wrong contract that was intended for somebody else. So it, it well, it was amendment. There's two amendments and both amendments. And one of them actually I processed and we were ready for signature. And when they caught that, they were like, oh yeah, no, there's no cost extension. It's not for you. It's for another university. That was fun. Wow. Definitely an interesting personality. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the, nobody else has any that they want to jump in with at the moment. I think we can move on to our um, next topic for discussion, which is um, some negotiation strategies.
And we have a, a few tips and tricks that we would like to share with you that have um, worked well for Jessica and I in the past. And then we are very, very interested to hear um, what other additions you all may have that you're willing to share with the group. Next slide, please. So ultimately, you're negotiating because you have a desired outcome. But the other parties involved also have goals in mind. And the more you can solidify and understand the goals of all the parties, the easier the negotiation is going to be. So first thing, you really want to know, well, what is your, your, your personal goal? Solidify your position, knowing what you can and cannot agree to. So if you're negotiating a research contract, know the policies and regulations of your institution and governing body. Know your PI's proposal. You know, what is it that you actually are going to be doing? If you're negotiating in life for car or your salary, know the true dollar threshold that you can and cannot budge on. If you're negotiating other personal matters, identify those core values that are most important to you where you know you can't compromise. So then once you have that, this is the most important part. You need to actually listen to the other party, listen to their goals and their core principles. Figure out what everyone's underlying goal is, because ultimately you have one big goal all together. Um, if you truly listen to everyone, then you're going to be able to find compromises that help all of you win to settle your agreement. Next slide, please. Okay, so this one is really a three for, for I don't know if that's a word, but you know, if you have a two first, two, that there's three different strategies um, on this slide that I want to go through with you. Um, and it should be pretty, pretty simple to remember, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, the first one is reduce. Uh, you want to reduce your key points of the negotiation to the items that you believe you may reasonably get and focus your attention on your must-haves. And I always try to do this at each stage of the negotiation. So I'll do this in my initial review and I'll go through and I'll try to carefully look at what are the terms, what strategically do I wanna ask for? What can I live with? Um, and then that I send forth those edits to the other party. Um, when I get the response back, I look through their responses. Again, as Jessica said, you know, listening to them, understanding the points that they're making, I'm able to see maybe they have been very um, conciliatory and they have tried to accept as much as they can and they've accepted many of my edits, but there are a few sticking points for them. And so I will look at those remaining items and then try to reduce it further. Maybe there are some that are really truly important to them that I can tell from their comments and really we can, can live with. Um, so maybe I'll just, in the, again, in the spirit of collaboration with them, say, you know, yes, we can we can live with this. Um, and then focus down, it's like, well, this, this one point, you know, is really something I, I do have to push back on. But maybe I can tell from their comment that there's some room for compromise so that I can find a way to propose something back that will suit both of our needs. Um, so you wanna keep that reduce um, strategy in mind, each set of revisions that you're going through. The next one is reuse, um, and Jessica and I were talking about this when we were preparing for today, and I think this may be um, one of our, our favorites, if not our favorite strategy. Um, reuse your old agreements. You do not have to recreate um, something from scratch, reinvent the wheel. Um, you can use what you've already negotiated or your institution has already negotiated. Um, so this is where you reach out and you say, we've agreed to terms for a similar project last year for a different PI. Can we please agree to those same terms again? Um, the, a big benefit of this is it's going to save you a lot of time um, potentially in the negotiation, um, but there are other benefits as well. It sets up a really good tone right out of the gate with the other party because they know you're also respecting their time and you're trying to make the negotiation simple and efficient for them by not having to rehash old issues and being able to use the same terms. It also lets them know um, kind of subtly um, that you're kind of, you know, you're on your game and you have either some experience working with them in their institution um, and or your organization is very organized and has a filing system, database management system um, that allows you to easily pull your old agreements and review those terms. Um, so this is kind of a key to being able to utilize the strategy and something that Jessica and I definitely would recommend to all of you. If you do not currently have 
a system where you're able to enter an agency or contracting party name into a database and easily pull your old agreements, or perhaps you know, we have a, a shared file that we also use where we have our contracts organized by the agency um, so that we can very quickly um, really is one of the, the first things that we do when we're working on a contract is to go into that folder and see, do we already have an agreement with this entity? What terms did we agree to before? Okay, great. I can live with those. Let's try to use this again. Uh, the third strategy on this page is recycle. Um, you can recycle arguments that have worked successfully with the contracting party in the past. Um, so, for example, as you may recall, we have certain requirements as a state institution, which you were amenable to in the past. I've marked a few requested changes in line with those requirements for your review and consideration. Um, you're basically um, not using the exact same agreement as you had before, but you're just using um, some of the same arguments and positions that they were agreeable to um, so that you can kind of build from the success that you had in the past um, moving forward into the future agreement. Next slide, please. I think it's really important to remember that you can use the strategies that we use for negotiating agreements in the real world and vice versa. Um, so what, what strategy did you use the last time you purchased a car uh, when you negotiated your salary? Uh, we would love to hear any real life examples you have uh, from when you negotiated and I will give you one uh, real quick, I think go to the next slide. Um, has anyone here lost a negotiation to their child? I, I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old at home and my four-year-old is already a master negotiator. She's definitely skilled at charming and disarming. Uh, she leverages past experiences and her knowledge of what she knows mommy wants in order to get what she wants. Uh, this past weekend, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a real conversation we had. So she says, mommy, can I watch just one show? It's like, no, baby, you already watched TV earlier. We need to take a break from the TV. But mommy, I have a good idea. What if I clean up all the toys? Then you let me watch just one of my shows, one that you like. She means an educational show. And then when you tell me it's time to turn it off, I pinky, pinky promise I'll turn it off without crying. Is that a good idea? And yes, I gave it and I let her watch her show because her argument was very sound. Um, so I'm curious, like, what are your real life negotiation tactics? Have you, you know, negotiated with a toddler, a teen, your significant other about daily household chores? We would, we would love to hear. It looks like we've got some comments in the chat, some, some other colleagues who have some similar experiences. I definitely can relate my, my daughter is just a, a few weeks younger actually than, than Jessica's and have had extremely similar um, experiences. And I, I think that maybe for some of us in this field, Jessica and I have talked about that maybe, you know, we, we are creating this, we are building these little negotiators um, and kind of teaching them um, maybe unknowingly um, how to become a really strong negotiator at an extremely young age. Um, but it can be kind of disheartening to come home and, um, or, you know, from our, from our home offices for some of us uh, after a day of, you know, negotiating these really tough contracts with these, you know, large corporations and you get what you want, and you're doing great and you're feeling good. And then you just lose this negotiation to a four-year-old. And it's just kind of a deflating feeling. It's like, I do this for a living. Like, why am I not winning all of these negotiations? So uh, definitely can relate to that challenge. Comments definitely reflect that. A lot of people have experience negotiating with their children, negotiating with their pets, uh, taking different approaches depending on the age of the children. Um, yeah, a lot of shared experience. Okay, I guess let's go on then to the next slide, please. And I've got a story for you all with this one as well. Um, this next strategy I like to call the silent treatment. This is where you use a well-timed pause to encourage the other party to offer further concessions. Um, and as we've noted on the slide, um, it does not have to be a long pause, just five seconds can be enough. Um, but the idea behind this is if you're ever having a conversation with somebody, particularly maybe somebody that you don't, you don't know all that well, um, and there's this kind of 
stop of, of conversation. There's a pause. Um, it can be a little bit, you know, awkward and uncomfortable and kind of put, put you on on guard that, you know, did I just say something that offended them? Um, you might feel this need to try to fill the empty space with additional conversation. Um, and so sometimes you can use this technique to your advantage to get the other party to try to, you know, feel, feel that tension um, and feel the need to, uh, to fill that empty space with additional concessions. Um, and I have used this strategy very effectively um, the last time I negotiated um, to purchase my car. Um, we're at the dealership, my husband and I were sitting, um, my daughter and the sales associate we've been working with, and he brought in his manager um, to help in the negotiation. Um, and I put that in quotes because uh, the manager's approach was to come in and offer me um, his proposal and kind of went through, you know, the base price of the car that I wanted, um, any additional add-ons, fees, et cetera, and came down to, you know, the final price, um, which I knew was, was really not um, where I wanted to be. Um, but I could see in, in his face that, you know, he seemed very eager to sell me that car that day. Um, so, you know, he put that proposal forth. Um, and rather than, than saying anything at all, I just, I sat for, you know, a couple moments, just, just sat. Um, and probably within, you know, just two, three seconds, you could see the expression of his face. He started to kind of shift um, his feet back and forth. You could see some tension in his face. Um, and, you know, you could see those wheels turn and like, oh, no, am I going to ruin this deal? Did I, you know, push too far in the wrong direction? And immediately he jumps in and offers a counter offer to his own offer, um, to which, you know, I, I listened to it and it was you know, still not really where I wanted to be. So, you know, I sat for, you know, a couple more seconds. Um, and then you could see again the, the rising tension. Of, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose this sale! And he jumps in again with a better offer. Um, so we went several rounds of this, um, where me and my husband um, and the sales associate, my daughter's mostly running around the, the showroom, um, but the three of us kind of sat and watched as this manager basically negotiated with himself um, down and down and down to beyond the price that I really thought was reasonable for the car to a really better deal than I even thought I was going to get. Um, eventually, I, you know, I kind of felt like, you know, probably this is about as far as, he, as he's going to uh, be willing and able to go. So I said, okay, you know, we, we accept that deal. Um, and he was like, um, and he later told my husband um, when he was paying paying for the vehicle, it's like, man, that was that was a tough negotiation. That was maybe one of the, the hardest negotiations I, I, I've had. What does your wife do for a living? And, and my husband was like, oh, she she negotiates contracts. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, that kind of makes sense, but. Um, as impressed as he was with my negotiation skills, I really wasn't doing anything very complicated um, that you all cannot take and use um, in your own practice as well, both you know, in the real world, like the example of buying a car or in your contract negotiations at work. Um, you don't necessarily want to you know, throw this, this out for you know, every situation, but in the right situation um, with the right personality type, um, again, possibly the salesperson, as in my example with, with the, um, the Mazda sales manager. Um, this can work to great, great effect. Um, you also don't lose a whole lot by trying it. If you pause for, you know, five seconds only, um, it gives you a chance to kind of, you know, regroup, think through what your next argument might be. If they don't offer anything else, you've given yourself some more time to kind of prepare for your next statement. Um, but maybe you get lucky and maybe they, they throw out a better offer and you can um, propel the conversation without really even having to do a thing. Next slide, please. As our final negotiation tip, we want to remind everyone to keep your end goal in mind. You don't want to storm the castle with cannons if you're hoping to work on projects together in the future. No one wants to have to rebuild a bridge after it's already burned down. And as Becca mentioned earlier, it's really helpful to remember in negotiations that the person on the other side is a human being just like you doing your same job. And honestly, you never know, is that person going to be your future coworker, your employee, your boss? I, we never know in this field. So we want to remind everyone that you know, keep your end goal in mind. What is what is the true intent? Is that we all want to collaborate and work together in a positive way? So we have a few questions for you all. Um, 
have you used these strategies before? Um, which one of these is your favorite? Are there any other strategies that you have used or have you seen others use successfully in the past? Um, and if so, please, please do share with the group um, if you're comfortable. Feel free to, to unmute um, and, and jump in or to add your, your comments into the chat. I could add, I have a almost a counter to the silent treatment, but this is for when your email to a sponsor just goes completely unanswered for weeks, you know, they're giving you the long silent treatment. I have found it helpful to reach out and say, do, do we still want this agreement in place or is it no longer applicable? And almost every time I will get a response within a matter of hours, like, no, 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 we still want it. We still want it. So uh, a, a related, a little different situation, but if you're ghosted for a while, I find that tactic seems to be helpful. We also have some comments in the chat um, about when using this, these strategies, uh, selling a house, um, flea markets, international bazaars, um, learning that uh, you should never bid against yourself when you're negotiating. Great point. <laughs> I found it very helpful to, to establish a good relationship with the PIs. I know you both mentioned that earlier, but um, so far what I've seen that if you have a good relationship with the department you're working, with the people you're working with, negotiations tend to be much easier when your institution as a whole is on the same page with the, across the table from the other side. I 100% agree. As somebody who used to be on the research side, I think it's really helpful to know that the administrator has your back, understands the importance of your work and you know what needs to be done, which is why it's important as an administrator to fully explain, well, these are the hiccups. This is what I'm trying to work out for you and so that everyone is on the same page. Absolutely. And I think that extends to everyone internally to, you know, you and your PI to your um, departmental administrators to colleagues in tech transfer or other compliance areas that they might be joining in the conversation, um, as well as to your leadership. Um, if there are tricky terms that need to end up getting escalated or they maybe need to join in on a conference call, making sure that everybody is prepped and ready um, and on the same page for the discussion. We have a question in the chat. How many times have you had to actually end a negotiation and not accept the agreement? What was the breaking non-negotiable term? I would say a very, for me in my career, very, very, very rarely. Um, maybe you know a handful of times at most um, that there was not an, some kind of ability to come to um, an agreement. And I think that um, usually when there are those kind of situations where there's a cheap breaking point, um, in my experience, a lot of times they come down to um, the faculty and, and what they want and what they need for their research. And a lot of times they're, they're actually the ones that will, will pull the flag and say, no, 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 I don't want to agree to this. I'm not comfortable with this. It's not worth it to me um, for this um, particular agreement. And they will actually make the decision to walk away. Um, Jessica, I don't know if you've had some, some other experiences as well. I, I can think of one agreement in particular where a company wanted us to do some tests for them, but they didn't want us to publish the results if the results were not were not to their advantage. And of course, you know, that goes against our our core principles at our university. Um, we escalated up to our AVP. We finally settled that UCF could sign if we agreed that no one could publish any results, no matter what, but the company ultimately did did not agree with that and we did not move forward with the agreement. I have a comment in the chat here that uh, we had to walk away from a contract once where the sponsor said that they wanted the right to modify our results and wouldn't budge. Any advice? Tricky. Sorry, uh, 
Another question, any advice on how to address your emotions, such as frustration with another party prior to a call or meeting? Oh, wow. That, that's a great question. I feel like there's a lot of different ways that work for different people. Um, what's worked for, for me very well in my career is sometimes just venting to my coworkers. Um, honestly, we have a very wonderful, supportive team here at UCF. Um, sometimes you know if you're dealing with a, a complicated agreement or you know a different difficult personality on the other side um kind of having that, that shared experience with somebody else you know internally that you can talk to like oh man like this guy's really giving us a hard time on this agreement and you just kind of you know go in, and quietly internally with yourself you know kind of let it out um and then you feel a little better and you're you're able to to go back into that um, negotiation, um, you know, feeling a little better that it, at least you have that that shared camaraderie of the the difficult experience. Yeah, and and if you're going to respond to an email, I find it helpful to sit on the email and go back and reread it. Or a few times, I've reached out to a colleague to say, "Hey, does this sound a little too harsh?" Because <laughs> like, I recognize that internally I'm feeling a little angry. So, you know, That's a never point. reply right away. Yes, and I've definitely done that too, or, or write the email, take out everyone from the um, the two line to make sure that you don't accidentally send it, write all the draft different versions of what you really want to send, um, and then when you're feeling better, you know, maybe you've taken a few moments, you know, an hour or so, or however long you need to kind of cool off, you, know, you go back and, and write the email that really needs to be written, um, and kind of, you know, still, still advocating for your position, of course, but, um, you know, in a, in a professional way. We have a, a few more uh, comments here, uh, taking a break, uh, going for a walk or run. Um, there's also a comment here that uh, we have a post award uh, in Grant Accounting, um, a person joining the discussion. And so this person's negotiations are with departments within uh, her university, uh, sorry, within their university. Uh, so getting tough with them can be tricky to maintain those relationships, but some of the time just really need you to be forceful to get things done. Um, so one of the things, you know, discussing uh, repercussions, um, if they're unable to move forward with something, what will happen um, if they're unable to move forward with it? Um, uh, there's a comment here that uh, this person had to walk away from a contract when the sponsor increased the scope, but not funding. Um, and the PI determined that they wouldn't be able to successfully do the work uh, with the minimal amount of funding. Yeah, I'll add that that's a great line of my experience is that you know, sometimes sometimes the PI is the one that just says, you know, this is not going to work for me. Um, and that's, that's just how it goes. And it's examples like that that are why we always want bilateral modifications, making sure that we can walk away if the, the change is not something we want. We have another comment here that uh, overexerting yourself on other matters prior to a meeting can make you calmer and more clear minded before the meeting. Great point. I don't know if this is possible, but uh, no caffeine. I found <laughs> having a big cup of coffee before and gets me jittery. Hey, different strokes for different folks. I feel like, you know, for some of us, maybe having that little extra caffeine boost, you know, amps us up and gives us, you know, the pep we need to jump in there and have that conversation. So um, can definitely see though, where, you know, for, for some, maybe maybe shutting down the caffeine intake might be, might be a good call. Um, I wanted to go back to you and mention kind of, you know, pointing to you, um, the really excellent point that Jessica made um, earlier about you know, not being afraid to utilize um, strategies from the real world to research contracting and vice versa. Um, to me, this isn't just really, you know, a tip that you can use. It's almost kind of a, a contracting philosophy. Um, and I, I think this might be something that you can kind of keep in mind, particularly, um, you know, for any of us who are feeling maybe um, you know, insecure about our, our contract negotiation skills or if you're new to contracting, um, you know, don't feel like I'm going into this room and I've only been doing this for less than a year and there's going to be these attorneys on the other side from this big corporation and they're going to eat me alive. Um, you know, always remember that you have a whole lifetime of experiences of negotiating for things. You may not have been doing it in that work setting, negotiating a contract, 
Um, but you've been negotiating things all your life. Anytime you want something um, and maybe you don't see eye to eye to someone, you end up doing a kind of negotiation. I mean, from the moment that we are born and we're, you know, babies, um, you know, we're trying to get what we want. And, you know, at that point, you know, you can, you can cry and you can move and you can try to get the adult's attention to get what you want. And as you develop, you get those more and more advanced verbal skills um, so that just like Jessica's daughter, you can really um, advocate for yourself to get a little extra TV time. Um, that's what's important to you. Um, and then you grow up and maybe you go to school and you get a test result that you're not very happy with and you negotiate with your professor to argue why they should bump up your grade. Um, you know, you're so close to that next level. Um, and maybe you have to, like I did negotiate to buy a car or you negotiate your salary. Um, there's all these kinds of real world experiences that you have in negotiating. Um, so, you know, use that to kind of build your confidence and build you up when you're going into that negotiation to remember you have all of those experiences that you can pull from and a lot of the same strategies that you are using in your everyday life, you can apply to research contracting. Um, so, so use that to make yourself feel, feel good about yourself and your position. We have a, another comment here that this person likes to pre-negotiate They anticipate potential arguments before they start the communication and try to figure out uh, where they can bend and how they can counter before engaging with the other party. Uh, when possible, of course, uh, we can't predict uh, everything. Yeah, that's really good. Like figuring out where you know you're going to be able to bend and where you know you aren't going to before you even enter into a negotiation. It's excellent. Yeah, that's very smart. Anyone else have any amusing negotiation stories they would like to share? It doesn't have to be, you know, with a contract. It could be with your kid. We have another comment here. Having a negotiation plan. In a former job, this person was negotiating dollar amounts. Uh, they had planned their offers out and uh, tapered them down to indicate uh, when they were running out of money. Very nice. Right. One strategy that I've, I've used. All of you. <laughs> I was going to say, John, we're getting raised in the silent treatment to try to create that little awkward tension. So some of you will want to want to fill it with your stories. Um, uh, and you know that's a weakness for me. I, I don't like the uh, silent uh, treatment. Yes, I think, I think, Jeff, based on the fact that you jumped in there, I think, see, that's perfect demonstration of how that strategy <laughs> Take effect. You know, Jeff has got this very, very personable relationship building personality, you know, felt felt that awkwardness and he he jumped in to help us out. So thank you so much, Jeff, for, for demonstrating that for us. Absolutely happy to do it. I'm very self-aware that that's a weakness for me. So if you're negotiating against me, it's a, a really a great tool to use against me. Uh, I was going to say that um, in a negotiation uh, in the past, I've uh, offered a flexible schedule. So if I'm negotiating with uh, an entity in a foreign country, um, and there's obviously a huge time difference between the two locations, um, I make myself available. Um, and I had one negotiation that occurred in the middle of the night. Um, they were so appreciative of me making myself available at a time that was convenient for them. Uh, the negotiation went really well. It started off on the right foot. They understood that we were compromising and that we were doing everything we could to get the agreement in place. Um, and that was uh, an successful approach that I've used a couple of different We have a couple more comments here. Um, uh, the, this person usually introduces themselves um, as soon as they know that they will be included in the negotiation. Um, this usually makes uh, a more comfortable and organic conversation. Um, I'll add to that. Um, I think that's really beneficial, particularly on email chains that include a lot of technical folks, because let them know that you are you are the main point of contact you know, for any decisions that are being made, you know, they should all run through you. So by knowing who to reach out to, that's really good. Plus you're, you know, being very personable, introducing yourself saying, hey, I'm your point man here. Absolutely. I think it fits right in with that charmer personality type that we were talking about earlier. Um, you're building that strong um, relationship and that foundational um, basis for negotiation right out of the gate. We have a question in the chat. Uh, do you tend to experience harder or more complex negotiations with larger entities such as Lockheed, uh, Facebook, 
Uh, if so, how would you prep before the start of the negotiation knowing uh, the history of the entity? I would say yes. <laughs> so we, we probably do tend to have more difficult negotiations with um, industry um, sponsors, particularly the, the larger corporations. A lot of times they, they do have a very strong you know, bargaining position that they're coming from being such a, a large corporation and um, they may not necessarily you know, need our, our project as much as our you know, faculty member is eager to, to do it and have it as, as part of their, um, their resume. Um, I think one of the best ways you can kind of prepare for that is really um, understanding, and, and if you're not the one that's worked agreements before, then talking with your colleagues, going back to your files, and understanding the history of the relationship. Again, like Jessica and I were talking about looking at the previous agreements, um, but then also, you know, reading through if you've got email working papers that you can read through to understand the exchanges, um, talking internally, um, making sure, you know, as we talked about before, that everyone internally is on the same page. Um, talking with your faculty member and your departmental administrators who can be great resources to give you background um, as far as the history of the agreement, um, you know, maybe what the other side's key um, points are, kind of what your key points are, so you kind of know going into it, um, you know, what, where each side is coming from um, as much as possible, so you can really kind of get, get prepared um, for that negotiation. Um, and sometimes too, I'll, I'll throw in another thing that you may consider with um, companies that you do frequent business with um, is having regular standing check-in meetings. Um, and again, one of my one of my colleagues, um, who again is an excellent excellent negotiator, um, has regular standing meetings with one of the companies that we work with on a regular basis, and they have. Um, some contract representatives and technical representatives that all get together on the call and they go through and they talk about um, current projects, projects that are maybe in the works. Um, it's a time for them to check in on the progress of specific contracts, make sure things aren't falling through the cracks, um, but also kind of keeps that relationship going in a very positive way. Um, so that when we get a new agreement from them, it's not like it's just coming out of the blue. You know, we, we know that it's been, been building up for a while and we're expecting it and we're ready to jump on it. Um, and I think that that is something that's often very appreciated by the other side, and it helps to, to make them more open minded to um, you know, any potential concessions that we may ask them to make. And I think if we have these conversations early on and we know, hey, we really want to establish relationships between us, we can even go the route of doing master agreements, you know, like finalizing terms to make future agreements a little easier. We have another comment in the chat. Uh, if you have familiarity with the other party, it helps to keep in mind uh, where are they willing to bend. Uh, when you know someone, you got a feel for what their endpoint is. Uh, basically, knowing sort of what their threshold is, um, what's the the line in the sand for them. Definitely. We have another comment here. Uh, as a counter, as counterintuitive as it may sound, I generally ask. For everything I want in a contract negotiation, even if I think I may not get it, surprisingly, uh, very I very often get concessions uh, that are not expected. Uh, but when I do that, I'm also prepared to be cons conciliatory in negotiating their pushbacks as well. Another great point, and you're not going to get what you don't ask for typically. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes if you sense it's the right opportunity, it doesn't hurt to ask. And, and then, then exactly exactly as you said, you know, just be ready to know that, you know, if, if there's pushback, you, you kind of have already thought through what are your must haves and, and where are you willing to bend um, so that you're ready with that next response. That's a great approach. Um, Amber makes a great point that um, if you take this strategy, um, then you may learn a lot more about um, the other party that way. If you ask for everything that you want in a contract, you'll get a better understanding of uh, the company's positions. Absolutely. It looks like we may be approaching time. Yeah. Um, so Jessica, I don't know, do you have, do you have any last thoughts you want to share? or I can. <laughs> I, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to come here and, you know, reach out to colleagues, reach out to us if you have questions about anything. That's why I love this conference. It's a great way to make new friends in this field. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Jessica. Well, thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, Jeff and, and Jessica, and to all of you who participated. We, we really enjoyed this discussion, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.